I don't know why Ilga chose to put the two nerdiest presentations as the bookends for this day, but I've done my best to try to make the Jogjakarta principles a sexy topic for you today. Um, uh, I wore a dress. And I spent way too much time on my slide presentation, so <laughs> I'm just going to go through it now. So, how many people in the room have heard of the Jogjakarta principles? Yay! Okay. Well, if you've been in any of these plenaries, you've, you must have heard about them if you weren't sleeping, because it's been referenced quite a bit. But just a quick recap. We're talking 10 years ago now, 2006, a distinguished group of international experts got together to hammer out a concise set of principles dealing with how international law applies to issues of sexual orientation and gender identity. Why was that necessary? Well, what existed before then was a bit of what the High Commissioner at the time, Louise Arbour, called a patchwork quilt. So we had a number of legal principles, domestic, in, uh, international, and some regional. We had uh, various references in different pieces of the international, regional, and national uh, structures. Um, but it was very hard to define, and it allowed states to get away with the argument of saying there is no clear um, path for how we should deal with these issues. So these experts got together and they came up with these principles. And the other, that, that's the document on the left, and the document on the right is the accompanying activist guide that goes with the principles. Um, there's two websites that I'm going to refer you to. The, the one at the top actually has all of the official six language versions of the Joe Jakarta principles. And the website on the bottom is actually a tracking site looking at how the principles have been used over the last 10 years. Both of these documents are available outside right now at the APCOM booth if you want to go home with your own hard copies. And please do, because they're heavy and big and we don't want to take them back with us. <clears throat> so, and how many conferences do you go to you get to go home with like Arabic and Russian and Chinese documents? So please, pick them up and take them home. So, we had a birthday party last night. I don't know if some of you were there, but it was very exciting. Um, we got to celebrate 10 years of this wonderful document and all of the things that have happened. Um, we had a rainbow cake. It was very exciting, I'll just tell you. Um, and one of the things that was very moving about the night was that 10 years ago, one of the co-chairs of the process is now, 10 years later, the first UN independent expert on SOGI. So this was feeling like a bringing together and a coming home of, of all of the work of the last 10 years. Tried, I'm clicking it. Okay, oh darn, I clicked too much. Okay, so this is just a bit of a scan. It's really not the full picture at all, but I wanted to give you some examples of what you can do with geeky documents like the Jogjakarta principles. <laughs> so one of the biggest things you can do is translate them into many languages. And we've seen many groups and governments work together to translate this document as much as possible. And it's been quite a phenomenal process to kind of see how that's all evolved. Um, we've seen groups like an Indonesian group create a comic book for young lesbian women on how the principles apply to your daily life as a young person. Um, we've seen it used in the United Nations refugee agencies uh, guiding documents and policies. We've seen it used in court cases such as the case in India that I'm gonna talk about in a minute. So the applications have, have been broad and wide and it's been a very beautiful thing to witness over the last 10 years. So I'm gonna try, oh, in four minutes, to talk about the key, five key things that you can take away from these that have been very important for the activist community. First of all, 10 years ago, the term SOGI wasn't really around, and we hear it all the time now. But what existed prior to the principles was mostly a smattering of law around sexual orientation. And for the first time, the principles brought together, and came, the experts came together and said, we actually want to put gender identity on the same plane as sexual orientation. And this process was largely driven by activists in the room, activists from the global south who insisted that gender identity had to be treated on the same plane with sexual orientation. That was a huge victory. Second, 
definitions. Now, you would think sometimes this is self-evident, but up until that point, a lot of the legal decisions and cases around sexual orientation, mostly at that point, had no definition of what these concepts were. And we still hear this today, states using this argument like, we don't know what this means. Maybe this means sex with animals. Maybe this means the ability to define one's own gender as blah, blah, blah. So, you know, one of the things that the experts said is, at the very beginning of this document, we actually want to set out what this means. And while definitions might seem like a really geeky and weird thing to put in there, it's actually been incredibly useful, both to activists, to judges, to lawyers, to legislatures, to be able to look at a concept and say, here is a definition for what that concept means. Three. Three. Um, developing the right to recognition before the law. And this one, I, I really want to sort of underline this one. Um, this whole concept of your right to recognition before the law emerges out of uh, the Nazi persecution of Jewish people in the Second World War who were stripped, basically, of their claims to citizenship and rights before the law. And what the principles do is take the uh, law that emerged around that in principle three and actually expands it and says that this also applies in other contexts. This applies to someone's claim for recognition before the law as the gender that they identify as, for instance. And this has been a very powerful part of the principles. And we now see that in countries like Argentina, uh, Ireland, and Malta, that some of the legislation there has come pretty much close to respecting the entire intent of that principle. Number four, the right to privacy. Up until this point, privacy, and many people thought of privacy, as a geographic thing. You have a right to privacy in your own home. This whole concept of what you do in your bedroom or what you do behind closed doors is your own business. Uh, and that's still how many people think about privacy. But what the principles did is said, privacy is more than that. Privacy is not just a zonal issue. Privacy is also an issue about the decisions you make about your own body, and the decisions that you make about your relationships to other people. So that privacy is much, much more than just a geographic location or a set of decisions that you make in your own home. It's actually about decisions that you make when you're out in the world that are very private to you as an individual. And the Joke Jakarta principles really articulate this point. Um, and here's a little example of the comic book here. You might not think that it's self-evident that a comic book would discuss a right to privacy. Um, but this is how people have kind of used these things and been able to translate them into language that works uh, for activists. Almost done. My timer has stopped. Does that mean I'm finished? Oh. <laughs> okay. Two more slides. Okay, and the final one, and I'll point this out because as was noted last night, 10 years ago, concepts of intersex and activism around intersex and legal decisions around intersex were very rare. Um, but one of the things, and this is largely due to some of the activists in the room, but one of the things the principals did try to do is deal with the issue of medical abuse. And this has been one of the few areas of the principles that has been useful to intersex activists. It's also one of the few areas of the principles that instead of targeting states and governments, for instance, it actually targets the medical establishment because it is with the, within the decisions of the medical establishment that most of these abuses are being committed. And now I'll finish by just describing very quickly where we go from here. I think, okay. So we're now 10 years in, and if you were at the reception last night, you would have heard this process, but um, it was always envisioned that the Joe Jakarta Principles would be an evolving document. Um, so what is happening now is on the occasion of the 10th anniversary, uh, a number of organizations and experts are getting together and designing a process for how to actually evolve these in reality. 
So in the next coming months, you will see a very public call go out, and we encourage you all to take part in this, to provide input on the principles, to try to help us update them, to try to help us introduce all of the new laws that have occurred and taken place in the last 10 years that can expand the concepts of the Joe Jakarta principles. There will be a drafting team that works with all of your input and then comes up with a companion piece is what we're calling it now. We don't know what we're going to name it. Uh, that will sit alongside of the principles and expand its scope. And we were very pleased last night to introduce some of the members of the team that will be on that drafting committee uh, and moving it forward. So keep calm and move forward. Thank you. <laughs>